Thank you very much. Thank you for the very kind and thorough introduction. Um, it's always it's a bit strange when you sat there and just listen to someone rattle off half of your CV. Um, I should also not hide that I'm originally from Austria. I hide it quite well now. I've been in the UK for quite some time. Um, I, my German is awful, so please don't switch to German when you talk to me. Um, but yeah, I've been in the UK for some time and um, joined UCL as a permanent member of academic staff about three years ago, just before the pandemic. It's a great time to, to move a group. Um, but yeah, so today, because I, I read through the brief of the what, what I'm supposed to, to do in this uh, seminar, in this colloquium, so I will start off with um, a bit of a background introduction, just a few points about photo emission that I think are relevant within the context of what the group does. And I've also tried to sprinkle in enough theory for any theory colleagues to maybe be interested, but please don't ask any too detailed questions. Um, I can just give some kind of um, coarse grain summary of when we try and work with theorists and why I think that might be important. Um, so yeah, at the core of the group is really a photo emission or X-ray photo electron spectroscopy. Um, I have a love-hate relationship with what you see behind me, which is a classic overview of the particular HEXPIS or hard X-ray photo electron spectroscopy people like, which is supposed to show you all the amazing degrees of freedom that you have access to when you do the technique. You can play with your photon source. Uh, you can play with the sample environment, the sample geometry, and then, of course, you have a multitude of different detection mechanisms that you can use in your analyzer. So not just measuring the energy of a photoelectron coming out, but also its distribution in reciprocal space or its spin. Um, but it's a little bit choppy. So um, what I will do is just over the next 40 minutes or so, show you a few application areas, particularly in the hard X-ray area, in particular focus on heterostructures, but also bulk material, um, with the focus always somehow electronic devices, electronic applications always play a role in, in what we do. So yeah, as I said, I will have a few slides on XPS just to point out a few things for those of you who are grad students or not so familiar with the technique, although I think I've just counted six different analyzers on different chambers. So I feel a lot of you are familiar with it. Then a little bit about what's different in HACSPIS compared to the lab-based soft X-ray sources or UPS also that you might be used to. And then I have three short kind of examples. So in terms of bulk properties of what HACSPIS can do, I will focus on one system, gallium oxide, that we've been working on quite a lot recently. I'll give you a short interlude, um, so to say, on core state and particularly the combination with theory there why we think it's so important for theory to calculate core states. And last but not least, I'll show you a very applied example, which is about metallization schemes and how electronic switches together with our industry collaborators. But starting off, so, I mean, XPS is pretty straightforward. It's simply based on the fact that we irradiate the sample with an incoming, usually nowadays monochromated X-ray source in my flavor of photo emissions is XPS or HACSPIS. You then excite your electrons from within your atoms. Um, and you can do so, you can excite electrons from the deep core states, the semi or shallow core states, all the way up to your valence states to the Fermi energy. And then these emitted photoelectrons have a kinetic energy, which is what we measure. And that kinetic energy is directly, or we hope directly connected to the binding energy that the electron has within your, in your material. And somehow from that, we hope that we can make some interpretations about chemical state, local environments, and the electronic structure of a material. And all of that is based on the photoelectric effect. Those two guys don't need any introduction, but the three of them basically laid the foundations, both theoretical and experimental, in observing the photoelectric effect and coming up with various different versions of the equation that you can see. And again, just to drive home this idea that somehow the kinetic energy of the photoelectron is what you measure, the X-ray energy is what you set that's given by your source, whether that's in a lab or the synchrotron, and somehow that is related to the binding energy that that um, electron has within the atoms, which, which describes um, your material. And then there's always something um, that you have to keep in mind, which is the work function of your spectrometer or your sample, which will shift all your energy scales 
Um, but hopefully, if you do your experiments right, you can also control that. So there's really one unknown, big unknown in that equation that is the binding energy, and that's what we always try and somehow find out. Um, if you're used to photo emission in the lab, you probably will have predominantly, usually when you do this in the lab, um, you will be used to soft X-ray sources. So your aluminum, magnesium, calpha, your standard sources, one or two kV ballpark. And in photo emission, generally we can fight over the exact ranges, but you're definitely within the so-called soft X-ray range. If you are interested in surfaces and in valence bands or um, kind of the low energy region, you will have come across UPS. But what we predominantly do, we move the other direction from the soft X-rays, we move to the hard X-rays. And in photo emission, what we mean by hard X-rays is anything from 2 kV to about 12 kV. And the reason for those two numbers is that at 2 kV, you have to change the type of monochromator you use. So in hard X-rays, we use single crystal monochromators and from about 2 kV, that's where you have to go compared to gratings or other things. And the higher end is really limited by what your analyzer can handle. So even high energy analyzers can really go to about 12 kV kinetic energy. There are one or two that you might push to 15. But just to put that in context, right? Because if you're used to diffraction, for example, that's not hard X-rays. Hard X-rays is 25 kV or more, right? But for photo emission, when I say hard X-rays, I mean two to 12 kV. And if generally you have done XPS, the one thing that you probably know is it's incredible surface sensitivity, which we use a lot in surface science to understand the surface configuration, the surface chemistry of a material. And this, of course, Kai Siegman, who worked a lot on the initial design of the spectrometers. And he was a decent marketing guy. So on the left is one of the figures taken from one of his, his first kind of overview papers of what he then called ESCA, so electron spectroscopy for chemical analysis rather than photo emission. And he took a gold foil, that's what you see in the top. So it's the spectrum of a pure gold foil. He took it out and then you can see, it says after fingerprint, took it out, put his finger on, put it back in. All your beautiful gold lines are basically gone. You see a lot of carbon and oxygen. And as a side note, you also see silicon, which is actually rather unusual to have you on your hands unless you like hand cream. So Kai clearly loved a bit of hand cream because the silicone in the cream is usually what you can see. And since then, a, a lot of different companies and groups have done all sorts of different experiments by putting different fingerprints on surfaces and seeing what you leave behind. There's one nice one that compares your different glove suppliers and different lab gloves to show you, you can actually see what glove someone touched your sample surface with. So there are no excuses in general photo emission. We can always tell you whether you've handled your sample well. And that's great, but I'll tell you in a second why sometimes this is limiting. And um, for those of you who are a bit into your photo emission, um, just as a historical pointer, because we generally, when we talk about photo emission, always talk about the soft X-rays. And in many people's heads, aluminum calpha, magnesium calpha is where you start. But actually the first two spectra that Kai Sifan and his group published used molybdenum calpha as an excitation source. And that's over 17 kV. So that's definitely in the hard X-ray range. We would never actually use these energies nowadays for many different reasons. But these are the first spectra that they published. So on the left, you see the first core spectrum. It's the copper 1S spectrum collected with molybdenum calpha. And then on the right-hand side, it was also used for the first observation of the chemical shift. So this idea that in photo emission, lines will change their energy depending on the local chemistry, the local arrangement. So hard X-rays were there from the beginning, but I'll show you in a second why they then didn't continue and didn't become a thing as much as the soft X-rays have. So why, why hard X-rays? Why do we want to do that? What are the caveats? Um, in the next few slides, I'll use a few things that we've covered in a recent review where in 2020 during lockdown, a whole bunch of us hard X-ray people got together and tried to give an image of the state of the art of Haxpers across the world, across different synchrotron sources, et cetera. So if you're interested or you want to learn more about Haxpers, definitely a bit of self-promotion, check out um, the review. The original draft was like 70 pages. So, you know, it's a nice sort of eating so we can see. Um, but so Haxpers 
if you look at what people use it for, it's still a lot of the classic areas that you expect from your code submission. So on the left, a lot of applied physics, a lot of material science, a lot of condensed matter. Um, in terms of the research team, so the right hand graph is from us asking um, scientists at, at synchrotron beamlines where their user communities fall and what kind of science they do. And they already shifts a little bit because you can see that the biggest chunk is actually in the sort of thin film devices heterostructure community, which is not necessarily often the one for the soft x-rays because in heterostructures you won't see very far. And you of course also have a lot of energy and environment and then maybe more classic condensed matter things like strongly correlated systems. And then at some point you also get to catalysis, but for example, that would should be much bigger if we would talk about topics. Now, why would you go from soft to hard x-rays at all? What's the point? So the main motivation is that you increase your probing depth. So on the right-hand side of the plot of the relative photoelectron intensity for silicon in silicon. So very basic system. And these curves are basically a, a theoretical representation of the photoelectron intensity that you get from this line if you're using different excitation sources. And the sources on the plot are the standard available lab sources now. So have, you have your magnesium and aluminum, where 90% of your signal comes from the top six or seven nanometers. And then if you go to your silver sources, and then your chromium and gallium, which are hard X-ray sources in the lab, you can see that your probing depth increases quite sub substantially, right? So you can get to tens of nanometers rather than less than 10. And why do I care? Well, we work a lot on these sort of heterostructures, uh, heterostructures that you would use in a device setup where you maybe have multiple active layers or you have a metallization or a dielectric on top of the semiconductor that you might care about. So by extending the probing depth to a depth that is commensurate with our film thicknesses, which it nowadays often is, we're talking nanometers, we can probe deeper, we can probe buried layers, we can probe buried interface. And just to give you one example, so um, one thing that we work on a lot is sort of quick and dirty ways of making oxide films that are decently good to put in a transistor. So these are transistors where you just have indium oxide between two ele electrodes and aluminum and the gold electrode. And you might want to look at this indium oxide layer and you want to, for example, follow the conversion of a sol gel precursor or some form of lead chemistry precursor to the final oxide. And in a one-shot experiment with HEXPIS, you can get all of these corner of spectra that you see. And basically on the same plot of your sample, you can get the gold, the indium, the aluminum, all the way to your silicon substrate lines. Although of course the silicon is rather weak, weak now, because you're looking through about 70 nanometers of material at this point. In soft X-rays, if I would show you the soft X-ray image, you just see the gold. You see the top gold electrode, that's it. Whilst in Texas, you can go through all of these different layers. And for example, you can see your aluminum and silicon in both cases, you can see the elemental line and the oxide. Right now, this is a very simple example, but in principle, this is what you can do. Um, so why don't you do this more often? Why don't you all have a Hexbus machine in your basement? Well, the biggest challenge when moving from soft X-rays to hard X-rays is the drop in your photoionization cross-section. So that is basically uh, tells you how many photoelectrons you get for a specific atom, a spe specific orbital. And you, if you look at the plot on the left-hand side, these one electron cross-sections, the y-axis is logarithmic. And if you move from something like your soft X-ray range to your chromium or gallium, your hard X-ray range, it drops by orders of magnitude. So your signal that you're gonna get for the same orbital from the same atom in the same material will be three, four, five orders of magnitude lower. So this is why you need very intense X-ray source. And for a long time, the only place to get your intense X-rays from was at a synchrotron. So Huxbus is still a predominantly synchrotron-based technique. Um, there are at the moment, 25 beamlines in existence at 12 synchrotrons. And on the map, you can see 
where they are. So there is a good representation in Europe. Um, as um, Stefan said in the introduction, I'm a visiting scientist at Diamond. So Diamond has an excellent hard X-ray um, beamline. There are also others at Desi and Soleil in Europe that do that are very, very good hex percent stations. But note the bottom point. Spring 8 in Japan is still the leading facility. It has 12 beamlines out of the 25. So half of your beamlines are in one place. Um, most of those, or many of those, are actually for industrial users. So Japanese companies will basically buy themselves a beamline, and mere humans like us will never get, get to go there. So actually, you're talking about you know, half of the 25 maybe being available. And a lot of them are also in shared use. So it means that half the time it will be a diffraction beamline or a scattering beamline and the other half of the time it might do hack space. So there were really very, very few places where you could do this. Now I mentioned diamond. Um, and I just want to give you an idea what such a hack space beamline looks like. I mean. Um, the beamline called IO9 that I'm affiliated with at Diamond is rather special because it's kind of two beamlines in one. You have two undulators, two insertion devices, one for your soft X-rays, one for your hard X-rays. The optics are very different, so they kind of go their separate ways. And then you can see at the very right at the end, you focus them on the same spot on your sample. So that's pretty unique in that you can take your sample and on the same 30 micron each spot, you can measure soft X-rays, you can surface sensitive and hard X-rays, so you're about sensitive. So that's quite nice. And what I think makes this beamline also very special is that across a very wide energy range, you get very comparable energy resolution of usually around or below 250 milliB. So that makes your data set quite comparable if you change your excitation energy. And what do these beamlines Look like so. This is the main end section of um, I9. You see the very big shiny hemisphere. That's how you know it's photo emission. Um, and for just for scale, uh, current there is nicely posing the PhD student at group. He's like one meter ninety or so. So he's quite tall, and he's standing on a platform. So the whole thing kind of goes till the roof of of the of the, of the hut. So these are quite yeah. They're for tall people. I think it's definitely an advantage if you have a good reach. Um, to do a sample transfer or get to something. Now, one thing that's quite exciting for our community in the last few years is the advent and really the emergence of lab-based systems. So as I said, predominantly a synchrotron um, technique, only about 25 divided by two freely accessible end stations for scientists. And in the late, sort of from 2018 onwards, the first lab-based systems came on the market, the first commercial lab-based systems. And I want a disclaimer, insert disclaimer here, I'm biased. I worked with one of the companies here in the Omicron in the final benchmarking experiments development of their version of a lab-based HACSIS um, spectrometer. And that's what you see in the image. It doesn't look much different from most of the lab-based photo emission systems that you would work in, you've got an X-ray source, a monochromator, you've got your main analysis chamber with the load lock and then a massive analyzer stuck to the side. The massive analyzer is one thing that makes it maybe special. You need a very efficient analyzer because you're still wanting every single photoelectron that you can. But what's the game changer is a new generation of X-ray sources for the lab that are just much more intense that can give you a higher photon flux and in this case, you're moving away from a solid anode, like your aluminum foil or coat, aluminum coating, your aluminum calcer, to a liquid jet of gallium that you hit with your electron beam to create your X-rays. And because it's a liquid, it's basically a fresh anode all the time. You can hit it with very high electron energies. This one uses the 70 kV electron beam. So therefore you can get a lot of X-rays out. You can still afford to monochromate them which is where you lose a lot of your intensity. And at the end, you still get enough photon flux to do your experiment in a decent time. Now, as a ballpark figure, seven times 10 to the eight photons per second under measurement conditions on your sample. It's not a beamline end station. End stations is 10 to the 13. 
on average, right? Still a few orders of magnitude lower, but you can show that with that sort of flux, you can measure core states, you can measure even valence bands, and you can do so in a decent amount of time. And of course, that would sit in your lab. No beamline proposals necessary, and you can measure 24 7, right? So there are some big advantages. And now the the other version of these lab-based HEXPAS sources uses a chromium kelpha source. So those are the two main energies that you can now get, chromium and gallium, about 6 kV, about 9 kV, that you can now purchase and buy from suppliers. And those suppliers will, of course, still sell, sell you also your aluminum kelpha. So in the lab now, you can combine soft and hard x-rays and have machines that give you that capability away from the synchrotron, which is for the community. It will it already, you can see that just the number of Haxpas papers increasing, the access for test measurements is going up. So for us as a community, this is a really big kind of change in pace and also change in, in uptake basically of the technique. Okay, um, so that was just a quick introduction to place both photo emission and Haxpas and maybe what the important points are, why we do it, what are the kind of complications and now I have my kind of two and a half examples. And I'll spend the longest time on the gallium oxide. So um, in our group, we do a lot on devices. And lately, one of the things uh, in terms of applications that we care about are power electronics. So electronic devices that can handle high power, that are good for power applications, for example, electric cars. Yes, you need all the batteries that everyone it's very excited about, but you also need electronics that can handle the power streams in your car, but also in your wind turbine, in your washing machine. Washing machines have power electronics in them and everything else. So it's a huge area of application. And we have some industry projects where we still work on silicon, silicon carbide-based technologies. But gallium oxide is sort of one of the possible next steps in terms of new materials that could handle as a semiconductor, as a wide band gap semiconductor, and the kind of power load, the temperature that you have in power electronics. So this is why the kind of applied motivation, but to be honest, it's just a really fun system to work with on the fundamental level, and I'll, I'll tell you in a second why. So as I said, gallium oxide, it counts as an ultra wide band gap material. And in that kind of bunch of materials, you have things like aluminum gallium nitride, aluminum nitride layers, diamond, gallium oxide, and cubic boron nitride. And what do they have in common? They all have a band gap that's wider than gallium nitride. You can say it's a bit of an arbitrary definition, but it's anything that's a band gap of larger than 3.4 eV is an ultra wide band gap material insulator. I don't know where the you know, cutoff is. I think a lot of the systems that I talked to people about today, they have smaller band gaps than uh, 3.4 and you would still call them an insulator, but yeah. Um, but what is exciting and why people care about studying these new materials is that the, there are figures of merit that we would use to say they are good device material. They scale with the increasing band gap in a really non-linear fashion. So you change your band gap a little bit, the figures of merit go through the roof, excellent. We don't have to push too hard and we can improve the material performance by a lot. But of course, one of the things is that these materials are still at the beginning. It's not like silicon, silicon carbide or gallium nitride who are much further down the development pathway. You're talking about kind of fundamental material science. And why do I think that gallium oxide is particularly interesting? Well, because it's quite complicated on a structure level. Gallium oxide, like many of the post-transition metal oxides, is a highly polymorphic system. So you have access to quite a rich structural space. And it has a whole range of polymorphs that you can make, that you can grow as epitaxial films, even as single crystals. And um, the main difference is simply the mixture of octahedral and tetrahedral gallium environments and how they are mixed and mashed together. So, um, you have the beta phase, the monoclinic phase, which is the most stable gallium oxide phase. And there you have the classic one-to-one -one mix of tetrahedral and octahedral gallium. 
there's alpha, which is on the left hand side, which only has octahedral gallium sites. And then, for example, with epsilon, which is on the right hand side, that is somewhere in between with the three to one mix, so still dominated by octahedral environments, but has some tetrahedral environments again. So that makes it quite interesting because we can get, as I said, single crystals or epitaxial films, high quality films of these materials. And we know that the only thing that changes in a sense is this idea of local coordination environment connectivity of those. And what we wanted to figure out was what is the relationship between that coordination and the electronic structure in essence. That was the question. Because what people see is when they look at these different polymorphs, they have different band gaps, they perform different new devices. Why is that? Um, I will for now, purposefully, you can see there are only three pictures here, and I kind of skipped over the gamma phase. I'll explain why, teaser, I'll explain why that is in a bit, but for now, everything I'll show you will just be the alpha, epsilon, and beta phases. So, what we did was we did soft and hard x ray. Photoelectron spectroscopy, we did X ray absorption, all of that at IO9. And then we had a whole bunch of lovely theory collaborators who did DFT on the one hand side to get projected densities of states to compare covalence band spectra. And we also, with Claudia Draxel's group, help us out with some DSD calculations to calculate the X ray absorption. Um, right. Perhaps with people, when we talk about electronic structure of a material, the first thing we do is valence bands. We do soft x-rays, we do hard x-rays. This is what you see in the middle top panel and bottom panel. Valence bands, soft x-ray, hard x-ray, you can see they already look very different. And that is predominantly because of cross-section effects. So when you go from the soft to the hard x-rays, the cross-section for any oxygen-related states drops whilst the gallium S and P states in particularly increase relative. So it means that if you care about figuring out where your different contributions are, how they're hybridized, what is the interaction, that is very helpful. And we always do that in combination with theory. And that's what you see in the panel on the left-hand side. So these are cross-section corrected, projected densities of states from DFT. And by looking at the pedo, with the cross-section corrections, comparing that to the experiment, you can now try and identify very subtle changes. So for spectroscopists, if you stare at them for long enough, you'll convince yourself that actually there are differences you understand. If you look at them quite quickly, it's probably a bit hard. But if you look at the, maybe in the pedos, it's a bit clearer, particularly in the soft X-rays, you can see that the fine structure, the relative intensities, of the different contributions and their energy positions in relative energy change with the polymer. Now, what you can then do in the theory, which is often much harder in experiment, you can just calculate your octahedral gallium and your tetrahedral gallium, tease them apart, mix and match them together, and you can basically show that this change in the structure that you see is directly related to the ratio of the octahedral and tetrahedral states in that material. And if you do that, you can now understand a bit better within your overall valence band, in your overall occupied electronic structure, what changes. And then these subtle, this gives information where you can then start to maybe have some idea of why they then, for example, react differently in the device in terms of how many electrons are available at the top of the valence band, how tightly are they bound, et cetera. So in essence, what you can see from this is that if we combine soft and hard X-ray photo emission with density functional theory, we can start to tease apart the influence of different coordination environments on the electronic structure of a bulk material. Now, of course, occupied states are great, but we want to also look at the unoccupied states to get the full picture. And that is much harder in X-ray spectroscopy. So in photo emission, by definition, you only ever measure up to the Fermi energy of your material. You cannot access your unoccupied states because there's nothing there to ionize. Um, but there is one way in oxides that's quite convenient to access the unoccupied states. And that's, that is by doing oxygen KH X-ray absorption. 
because that is uh, basically representative of the unoccupied states. And then if you can do it carefully, you take your photo emission, you take your absorption, you align them, and what you get is the top panel where you basically have your band picture of your solid with your occupied, your unoccupied states in the band of the There are a lot of caveats. If anyone's interested, I'm happy to talk about those for hours in terms of how accurate this is and arrow bars and everything. But it gives you a qualitative image now of your overall band structure. Um, and in parallel to what we did with the photo emission and standard kind of DFT, you can now do with the sort of BSD type theory approach for the oxygen for the unoccupied states. And again, you can correlate the differences in the overall structure in the position of the different peaks to the coordination. So for example, there are two features B and C in particular that change quite a lot between the different polymorphs. And you can show that these come predominantly from oxygen states that are tetrahedrally coordinated. So again, you try and figure out how these different coordination environments play a role. Um, when we worked on gallium oxide, we, of course, didn't just take valence spectra because we never do. We always measure the core states and the semi-core states. And something happened that caused us quite a few headaches. And that was we measured the core spectra, oxygen one has gallium to be usually quite boring lines at the best of times. But if you look at it, you will see that for the epsilon case, the oxygen line is incredibly broad. Even if you know nothing about photo emission, and I put those on top, you go like, hang on a sec. And it's only for the oxygen. The gallium line is almost the same. So what's going on? So the first thing is you have a headache, you question your samples, you question your experiments, you question everything in life. So we did a lot of measurements of surface and bulk. We measured, I think, six different epsilon samples grown in different ways, different thicknesses, just to exclude everything from surface states to contamination, to strain, to microstructural influence and all the other stuff that might lead to this broadening, charging, everything you can think of. And none of that was a good explanation. So again, we went to our theory friends and said, look, something is very odd here. Could you by any chance calculate four steps? Now that is a challenge for theory at the best of times, but they somehow managed. And the vertical lines that you see are the relative binding energies calculated for the different gallium and oxygen positions within the different polymers. And if you look at those lines, if you look at the epsilon, you see that intrinsically in the epsilon polymorph of gallium oxide, they spread out more. And that's again just due to the specific mixing of octahedral and tetrahedral environments, their connectivity with each other. So it's not just nearest neighbor effect, it's next nearest neighbor effect. And you can also see because this chemical shift that XPS relies on so much changes is dependent on the line you look at. It's not the same, right? And gallium has a pretty terrible chemical shift, whilst oxygen is half decent. And you can see that this makes a big difference. So this is to say that even the core levels, even some that we often expect in our examples to be boring, we collect them for completeness because we always want to show that we have a clean material, that we don't have too much hydroxide, for example. But you can really show that the chemical environment, the local coordination, the specific local structure in these polymorphs has a direct effect on your core states. Now, that's where I'm gonna go on a little bit of a tangent about core states. Um, over the last few years, my main thing, every time I talk to a theorist, is like, can you calculate core states? Because for phone permission, traditionally, <coughs> we know how to take a feed off from a DFT calculation correct it, broaden it, so it looks like our valence spectrum. We're quite used to that. There's still some caveats and limitations, but we're okay in doing that. But core states are a whole different kettle of fish. When you have to somehow take into account you're making a quarrel, the system somehow relaxes, what does that mean? So we started doing quite a few projects now, and I'll show you two of them throughout the talk on different levels of theory for different types 
types of materials to calculate core states and really help with the interpretation of core spectra. Because what do we do traditionally in photo emission? If you have carbon 1s on a catalytic surface, you've got four peaks, you do ambient photo emission, maybe you have all these different environments, and you go, well, yeah, we think this one is that one, and that one is this one, and you do this by some reference measurements if you're diligent, but overall it's down to interpretation and reference measurements and maybe some chemical intuition or expertise or whatever you want to call it. But actually, what we've realized quite quickly is forget about all this intuition stuff. We are often very wrong, but theory can really help to interpret the ever more complex spectra that we measure. And I mean, I did chemistry as an undergrad and I thought amino acids were simple. They're small, they're simple. You can get them, they're systematic. Well, turns out I was really rather wrong. And they're quite complicated in terms of long range order in the, in the solid, they're charged, et cetera. But anyway, we thought we'll take some amino acids, the simplest ones you can kind of get your hands on, glycine, alanine, serine, and we measure them in a way that we don't encounter any radiation damage, which is quite important in these. So we do fast acquisition, rustling photo emission, you get really nice spectra. And then we try with theory to calculate the chemical shifts in it. So what are my binding energy shifts for these simple systems? I have different environments of carbon. How can I do this? And um, basically in the end, what we got to was a way where you could do some simulated spectra. So you take your calculated binding energies, you know your line shapes from theoretical measurements and theory. So you create a void line shape around them and you can compare them to the peak fits that you might do for your experiment. And the theory is good enough in these simple systems to describe the overall line shapes, the binding energy positions, and if you put them on top of each other, this is what you see. So on the left-hand side, in the dotted lines of the experiment, the individual peaks are the calculated um, kind of line shapes, and on the right, it's switched around, so you see your peak fits and the vertical lines of the, the theory. And overall, you can identify your main chemical states. You also immediately see what are, what's your surface dirt, because this is not done in a, in a clean way, right? These are simply bulk powders of these amino acids. And you can also see small effects of radiation damage because you can never fully actually avoid that in, in amino acids. But it helps you tremendously in your interpretation. But of course, these are simple systems. So what we did in the next step was we said, okay, let's do something more challenging. And we went to more of the aromatic amino acids. So much larger, there's aromaticity. And if you just go to the aromatic compounds, it's really hard to understand even the theory and never mind the spectrum. So what we then started, again, it's great in theory, you just start chopping off bits of these molecules. And you can take a so-called molecular subspecies approach where you define subspecies, and that's what you can see all of the numbered ones are basically variations of these aromatic acids with different bits missing. And then you repeat your core state calculations, and what you get, what you can see on the left are these massive plots where you have your main amino acid that you care about, you have all your different subspecies, you have two lists different levels of theory, so Koopmans and Delta SEF actually, because they can take into account different interactions. And all the lines are now your different binding energies. And you can see how they change. You can really start to systematically understand what, when do they flip? So some of them really flip positions, which you would never expect from your kind of, as I call it, intuition or expertise. And when you do that, you can start to identify initial state effects, final state effects. You can distinguish between nearest and next nearest neighbor and even longer range interactions in your material. And overall, you just get a really good idea of how to interpret your core state spectrum. And particularly when we move more and more to in situ in operando experiments, more complex systems, it's simply not enough to just stare at it as a spectroscopist and go like, oh yeah, I think this carbon is this one and this one is this one. Um, so this is why in my opinion, I think the definitely still high level of effort needed 
to do core state calculations and to implement them in theoretical co codes and frameworks is so important. Because for us, I mean, I was maybe a bit cocky. I was like, oh, sure, I can tell you in the carbon what's what. And then I had to quickly learn I was rather wrong, right? So I think it's really important to have that interaction. The amino acids are just one case where we've kind of pushed it a bit further than in the gallium, but across most of our systems now, we care a lot about really basically unlocking all the information that you have on the core states, not just focusing on valence states, which is what hacks this traditionally, that's, that's our daily bread, right, valence spectrum, but really also using core states. Now, back to gallium oxide and to finish the gallium oxide story. I said I kind of left out the gamma in the first story, which was all neatly tied up with the bow, and you know we thought we understood it all. Um, and when we said to our theory colleagues, oh yeah, we also measured ga gamma gallium oxide. We've got beautiful data. Can't you just do the same that you've done for the other polymorphs? They were like, no, go away. And the reason for that is that gamma is a tremendous challenge because it has intrinsic disorder. So A, you can see this is the unit cell. It's much bigger than for the other polymorphs. You have partial occupancy of four different gallium sites. There is basically only one group um, and papers by Helen Playford who did neutron diffraction to get some idea of what that partial occupancy is like. But it's a very messy, chaotic system. However, as you can see from these beautiful TM images on the right, by collaborators of ours, you can grow this material with a high quality. You can also mix it with gamma alumina, and it does really interesting things, like the kind of electronic structure modulation, the band gap engineering you can do in the gamma gallium oxide system, in the gamma gallium aluminum oxide system, is really interesting. So there was a big driver to try and also see what can we do with photo emission and with theory to look at this system. So again, the experiments initially are the same um, as what I've shown you for the other ones. So we're still talking soft X-ray, hard X-ray, X-ray absorption at ion 9 On top of that, then there were quite a few optical measurements to look at band gaps, but where the main bulk of the work is, was the theory. So for this system, standard DFT, no chance. So I somehow convinced a colleague, Laura Ratcliffe, who was at Imperial and is now at the University of Bristol, to go a, maybe a touch crazy. I mean, I blame her for some of this. But in essence, what she did was to use DFT in combination with machine learning to come up with structural models for this disordered system, to then use a structure screening that was based on the decomposition of these structures on distinct local environments. So though it's so disordered, trying to make some sense of the chaos. And then in a code that can handle the large systems, plus can give us valence semicore and core state calculations to put this all together to compare to our experiments. On the right hand side, it's a bit small, but basically this is sort of the workflow of everything that happened. And at the end, we were nearly at a million structures that we searched through about 1250 DFT calculations to somehow identify a tiny bunch of low energy structures. And what you can do is you can identify these lowest energy structures. Here on the left, you can see the lowest two side, three side, four side. So that means how many of these gallium sites are actually occupied. Um, and you can then take these optimized structures to do higher level theory to get band gaps, you can correlate the different things you can calculate with the energy of the different um, structures. And you can show basically, unless you pick really the lowest energy structures, everything falls apart. Like your band gap closes, you have intergap states, and I will also show you a spectra fall apart. Um, but basically what you can do, you can take the theory of the lowest energy structures. Again, you can do these kind of band alignments from the photo emission, you can compare that to optical measurements and you can start to understand the band gap. It matches quite well between the different experiments and you can tackle the system. And from a photo emission perspective, what's nice is, so here you again have soft and hard x-rays. We do the same game as before. 
And what you see is always the same data from the experiment, but you see the corrected p dots, but for the lowest energy structure, it's slightly higher, and then again, it's much higher. And you can see very quickly, these spectra look nothing like your experiment. So you can really show that if you do the theoretical screening and calculations carefully, you can find a theoretical description of this material and you can use it again to do the same sort of interpretation of the subtle changes. And you can also say that definitely you will not have certain configurations. So particular foresight occupation, it gives you very strange high energy structures where you can see if you compare the spectra, they look nothing like what you measure. So this is quite something that we um, are quite excited about. And you see the same kind of changes if you look at the core states, et cetera. Um, okay, so this is kind of the big example. And now the last five minutes, just to show you something more, more applied that still has a little fundamental kind of hint to it. Um, I will move away from the semiconductors and to metallization. So um, the work that I will show you is predominantly driven by current. Again, another smiley picture on io9. That was the first week of his PhD. Now he's not so enthusiastically smiling anymore because he's been working on these metallization schemes for power electronics in collaboration with a rather well-known place in, in Austria, in Finian and Kai. And what his job is, is to understand metallizations for power electronics, particularly for silicon, silicon carbide, the industry standards. Um, copper as a metallization is now the standard in most devices. Um, however, there's one downside. Copper loves to diffuse into silicon oxide, cause dielectric breakdown, and your device falls apart. So you want to prevent that from happening, so you need a diffusion barrier. So something that stops copper going into your device structure. And what is that barrier? It's something we nicknamed Kai tungsten. It's a mixture of titanium and tungsten. So this is a very applied question. Um, we take industrially fabricated stacks that come out from major production lines. We take them directly. And again, we take them to our beloved photo emission end stations. And the main questions that we wanted to answer in this system are, first of all, this diffusion behavior. So why can titanium and tungsten block the diffusion of copper? But also, why does it sometimes still show breakdown? So if you stress these materials too much, for example, with heat, copper at some point still manages to get through. Why? How? But also the influence of oxygen. So there were some kind of urban legends that oxygen in these systems, somehow, if you have too much oxygen, it will also lead to a breakdown, but maybe a little bit of oxygen is a good idea, but it wasn't very well understood. Um, so I won't show you all the details. Um, we've published, I think at this point, three different parts of the story, but it's a good example where it's a very applied question, it's incredibly complicated. So we throw all of our photo emission at it. Also other techniques, right? Of course, TM, um, SIMS, diffraction, everything you can imagine, but even on the photo emission, it's a nice example of combining surface sensitive, soft X-ray photo emission, hard X-ray photo emission, resonance photo emission, and in situ photo emission to look at all the different aspects. So the diffusion, the oxygen incorporation, the surface versus the bulk, different driving forces that lead to the behavior. And what you get, and I don't expect you to look at the detail, are massive data sets of particular core state spectra now that you can use to systematically look at influences of external drivers of internal differences from composition to morphology to heat load to stress in these materials to really start to unpick how these things work and why they may fail. And you can start to follow these different processes sort of in a dynamic fashion by in situ experiments and one thing that you notice quite quickly is that it's quite a complicated system and titanium, if titanium ever works with it, you definitely expect it to oxidize. But in this system, you have titanium doing fun things with oxygen. You also have the tungsten partially oxidizing, and then you have 
diffusion that changes the ratio between the two. So it gets a little bit messy on the experimental side. So you have really complex behaviors. And this is where, um, again, fundamental science comes in because particularly for the tungsten, tungsten in the core space, so this, these are just a few fits where we compare different annealing stresses on one type of sample. And you can see the different chemical state, the different oxidation states of tungsten, tungsten six, tungsten four, change ratios. You have different oxidation environments coming up. It's rather complicated. And there are very few really good reference spectra. And particularly for metallic tungsten. So for example, this is another reason to try and calculate core states. Now, I showed you the amino acids, I showed you the gallium oxide, they are actually okay to calculate. If you go to a metal, things get even messier. And in tungsten in particular, you have a lot of different plasmons, surface bulk plasmons, you have interband transitions. It's a metallic system, which is a challenge for theory in any case. And usually for it to converge, you need a large number of atoms. But we are very fortunate that we have some really nice theory colleagues who do GW or GW plus C and who were willing to tackle tungsten. We also did some linear scaling with them and they can calculate the core states, including some of these plus one states, some of the interband states that you get. And you can start to unpack these really complex core level structures, right? So although we are working on a very applied question that is sort of hardcore electronics engineering, these kind of fundamental aspects are still very important. But to finish off on a slight sales pitch now, um, for your applied questions and for the industry research we do, there are two more things that are quite fun for us right now. One thing is to do things quantitatively. So I've showed you a lot of qualitatively nice spectra, little small effects that we can pick out, but we can of course, somehow if we're careful, also do quantitative stuff. So we can quantify all these different oxidation environments. We can quantify, um, the, for example, the uh, ratio between titanium and tungsten going in and out, how much titanium diffuses into copper or into your silicon substructure. You can do all of that. So that's quite exciting for the more applied stuff. And what you can see in the GIF on the right, we can also do things in situ. Diffusion in these systems is quite slow. So we can keep measuring at a beam line, we can heat the samples and we can watch, for example, the diffusion of titanium into the overlying copper metallization quite well. And you get all the spectroscopic information from the core states. And this is something that you can then compare reasonably directly to a stress test that a sample will go through in a failure analysis environment that is kind of commensurate with what the device sees during production or during application. So you can use a fairly fundamental surface science approach to really bring together this kind of, you know, going from understanding just bulk tungsten, which seems a bit boring maybe in the first instance to an industry collaborator, all the way to, you know, we're studying a diffusion barrier in power electronics. And that is actually kind of something that will have an effect on how well your electric car will work in the next five years. So it's quite satisfying to bridge that gap with photo emission and particularly with, with hard X-ray photo emission. And I hope I could convince you also how important it is to get theorists on board and have that part of calculating spectra, calculating valence semi-core and core states. So with this, I think, I hope I've given you a, a sales pitch for access and photo emission in general. And um, just for completeness, there are still many remaining challenges. So there are still a lot of fundamental aspects of what we see in the spectra that we don't understand. We are still trying to improve resolution, both in X and Y. We're also trying to find ways to extend our probing depth. Dealing with insulators is still a big trouble as synchrotrons, particularly with hard X-rays. But there are also a lot of exciting developments. So in our in operando setups, whether that's an electrical biasing, under pressure, you can go into the bar range now, doing ambient pressure access, optical excitations for photovoltaic, solar simulators, etc. The theory work that I've mentioned quite a lot today, but also things like improved angular resolution in ARPES and HARPES, 
spin detecting analyzers. On the optic side, better control of polarization of how do you tune your incoming X-rays. And then also last but not least, of course, the time resolution that we can now expect from X-ray free electron lasers, for example, in combination with momentum microscope, microscopy pushing to femtosecond to up to second time scales, the particularly for electronic materials are so important. Now, last but not least, uh, none of this was done by myself um, alone. So these are all massive projects. They include growers, they include synchrotron colleagues, lab colleagues, they include all of the theorists, they include us mayor, photo emission people. I couldn't fit everyone on, so I hope no one who hasn't quite made it onto this list is offended. But if you check out the papers, they're all there and in the right places. But these are really large con collaborations that need all of these different pieces to the puzzle. Um, and I've mentioned a few people throughout. I will not read out all the names, but just to really say, you know, this is a massive collaborative effort across all of these projects to bring things together. And of course, also our funders and um, synchrotron sources to give us access to things. And with this, I'm done. I'm very happy to take questions. And thank you so much for listening.